Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week, as part of our Rapid Fire series, we are looking at the top five blunders that can be made when it comes to investment properties. Plenty of things to take out of this. Most importantly, don't take plenty of notes. Make sure you take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Renshaw. Thanks for having me on the show, Mr. B. Now, after plenty of pressure from our clients last episode, we did a top five series, top five investment blunders. We spoke about property on that episode, and we've had a lot of, I guess, let's say chatter about what we can do in the property space. So top five investment property blunders is the topic of conversation yeah, today. It's an interesting one, isn't it? You know, oftentimes, because my business interests are predominantly orientated around the stock market, people often think, oh, you're probably not into to, into property, I'm a huge advocate for property. I think it's very, very important to have you know property and shares are a good combination. Um, and if I think back over my um, my property investing history, I don't think no, I haven't. I've made money on every deal, uh, so That's it's one. been a, a good area for me. But one area uh, that I've never done, so maybe that doesn't qualify me as being an expert on it, or perhaps it does highlight why we feel it could be a blunder, and that's buying off the plan. All right, well, let's kick off with that. So number one, buying off the plan. Mm-hmm. Now, anecdotally speaking, I literally just had a friend maybe six months ago, similar age to me, just trying to start out, bought an apartment off the plan, mm-hmm. never got built, deposit, gone. Mm-hmm. Look, there's a risk on attribute to this. You know, If you paid a deposit, uh, particularly if it's a high rise, for example, um, you know, and you've locked in a, a price that you're going to pay. If the market shifted up, sometimes a developer can tear up that contract, and you're left without the product. You get your deposit back, but you know, if the if the value of the property has gone up from say. 700 that you're going to pay for it and it's now valued at 900 when it's built, they, they're not going to sell it to you for that, the contract no. to get torn up. Equally, of course, if it goes the other way, uh, you're in the chair. So, you know, you originally bought something that you're paying 700 for, the market implodes, it's worth 500. You still have to come up with a 700,000 and you may find getting finance quite tricky uh, from the bank on the back of that. But the real pitfall with buying off the plan, look, it ticks an awful lot of boxes for investors. It's brand new, which means you've opened the door to, you know, quite a favorable depreciation schedule, at least over the early years. Um, there's a builder's warranty, which again is you know, pretty attractive uh, from an investor point of view. Um, it's likely to be pretty meat and potatoes, a stock standard box uh, in most instances, which again is uh, an easy thing to rent. Uh, so you know, it ticks a, a lot of boxes in that space. Um, so where does it fall down? And the answer is really simple. You're paying too much for it. Simple as that. Um, if you're buying off plan, the number of I guess, noses that need to be in the trough uh, to make that transaction work. Well, number one, you've got the developer's profit margin that's sitting in there. Uh, And then number two, you've got the property marketer, uh, the person that's lined you up with this wonderful opportunity for your super, uh, and they're going to be taking their clip out of it too. And, you know, you're not talking small numbers. Uh, You know, I've heard stories where there's $20,000, dollars $40,000 of rebate paid through uh, to the property marketing company that sold you the product. It's a big whack. You know, and that effectively is is coming out of the valuation on that property. So you're paying way, way too much for it. Um, you know, it's very, very hard to then add value. And one of my maxims traditionally has always been whenever I've done a property transaction, I always look to buy something that I can add value to. Um, either a renovation or a demolition and rebuild or uh, development or, or whatever it may be, uh, you know, multi-dwelling, whatever it may be, but you've got the ability to add value to that. And with something that's off the plan, it's usually non impossible to do that. So um, you're buying basically a cash flow asset, but if you're paying too much for it, then you're paying too much for it and the yield is going to be distorted by that. Gotcha. Moving forward, number two, this is an interesting one, and it probably comes back to what we spoke about in the previous episode, AB, with respect to having a plan. Mm. That's buying an investment property where you want, not where you're making money, if that makes sense. Yeah, again, Property, because it's such a a lumpy transaction in terms of you know the dollar value of it, you know I think most people's you know, primary place of residence is the biggest financial decision they make, and then maybe if they've bought an investment property or properties thereafter, the second, third uh, biggest decisions financially that they make, and that decision requires a pretty good set of skills, uh, a game plan, some education, and most importantly that discipline to buy for commercial reasons as opposed to a more emotive. Uh, decision. Oh, yeah, it was really nice because, you know, it had that nice fig tree across the road. And it's just, and, and there's a difference when you're picking an investment property between choosing factors that are going to, uh, uh, you know, give it inherent value, location being the primary one, that's going to drive your rent for a, for a start. Um, uh, and also amenities and things like that. So location is important. 
but you're not buying it to live in yourself. You're buying it for someone that can't necessarily afford to buy a place to live in, uh, and you're looking to to generate the cash flow from that. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it can make sense to buy in an area that you probably wouldn't want to live in yourself, but there's a very very strong uh, rental pool there. Uh, and that can be industrial towns. Sometimes it can be rural, in, in more regional areas, for example. Um, you know, uh, and things beyond that. So it may not be where you necessarily want to live, but when the numbers stack up, you know, it can become a very very good commercial opportunity. Not always, you know, you think about the mining boom, uh, a lot of those uh, towns went ballistic in terms of where their rents were and then you had the mining implosion uh, and then the backside fell out of the, the rental market and obviously the values of those properties, then it recovers again. So rather like trading, if it's if it's a fairly spicy, high risk area, you've got to accept that you may get those big capital swings. But if you're prepared to do your research uh, and you know there's an aluminium smelter going in town and that's a five year project before that comes online. So there are going to be people that need somewhere to live where they're building it. And then when it comes online, there's going to be a need for people to live in that work work there. So there's going to be a strong pull on demand for, for, for that property market. So that would make sense. You probably wouldn't want to live near an aluminium smelter, smelter, but then you're not living there. You're just renting it and collecting the rent check. Comes down to the numbers ultimately, doesn't it? 100%. Speaking of which, number three, a big mistake that a lot of property investors make is that they buy the property with the sole intention of being negatively mm. geared. For our listeners out there, can you explain what that is and why that's an issue? Okay, so negative gearing in its purest form is where the income that you generate from the property, the rent, um, after expenses and particularly in terms of the, the interest component on the loan is less than what it costs to service that loan. In other words, it's losing you money each week, each month. The attractiveness to that, particularly if you're a higher income tax bracketed person and you're set up in a way where you can then claim that loss on your property as an offset against your income tax. So it's a stock standard way for uh, a lot of people to reduce their income tax bill. You're still paying the money out, but at least instead of it going in tax revenue, it's chipping away at the property that you're going to own, hopefully freehold uh, by, by, by the, uh, an unencumbered uh, by the end of the, uh, the, the lifespan of the, the investment decision and, and you've used your tax to pay for it. So it's very attractive in that regard. Um, when we look through perhaps a different set of lenses at an investment decision, one of the things, uh, and we talked about that slightly earlier in this, in this session, is yield. And that's the fact that in order for something to have a yield, it's got to be cash flow positive. In other words, it generates a positive amount of income. Negative geared is a negative income. In other words, it's costing um, costing you more to hold the property than it's bringing in. If you had a change in circumstance, you lost your job, for example, you now don't have a need to offset uh, your income tax because you got no income. Having something that's a drain on your finances to support that loan is not that appealing. And I've had a client in the past, uh, I think she had some like 20, 25 negative year properties offsetting against a very substantial salary that she had as a professional services in the mining space. Big, big salary, big tax. And so that was the advice that she'd had to reduce that tax bill. I always want something that pays its way. So if you've got something that's positively geared, that's superfluous cash flow, you can do a number of things with. Number one, if you need it as income, you can pull it out. But if you don't need it as income, you can use it to pay down the debt and you can then look to build more equity in it to then refinance to then buy another property. So that positive cash flow can be much, much more attractive from an investment perspective. It's on a positive yield, it's making your money and that's what investments should do. Absolutely. Number four, moving forward here, AB, a lot of people fall foul of not managing their numbers. So specifically, we're looking at maybe your interest rates, so getting refinanced, your insurance policies, how much they're costing you, and really just what's going on in terms of the cost perspective yep. from the property. Exactly. You, you usually, you know, on its most basic level, the key things you want to look at is, okay, how much you pay for it? What's it worth now? And what are you renting it for? And, and they're three very, very important market points. Let's not, not, not lose sight of that. But it's also important to lift the bonnet a little bit and go, well, okay, what else is a factor here? And, and the rent is nice, but that's a gross figure. There's a net figure that needs to come out because you need to t take off, for example, your letting agent fee, which you know, in the past I've had, what, 7% plus the first um, couple of weeks, for example. That's so right, that's yeah. what you're, you're typically paying. So you need to take that off of what your annual return on that property actually is. Otherwise, you're getting a distorted figure on what you're making from that property. So that's important in the first instance. So knowing the real numbers, then it might be that it's in a multi-dwelling, in which case there's owner's corp. And these are the sorts of things that are really, really important to look at before you buy. Um, one of my very good friends uh, sadly passed away now, uh, absolute legend who I work with for the best part of nearly 20 years, lived in a particular building uh, on the Gold Coast. 
that would be the best building on the Gold Coast to rent an apartment in because the facilities were incredible. Indoor, outdoor pool, gym, uh, indoor, outdoor entertaining area, members lounge, incredible building. Uh, Marina, the whole nine yards. Woeful to own because the owner corp fees, the body corporate fees were astronomical. As the tenant, you're not paying it. As the owner, you are. So understanding what the body corporate fees are. So when you look at property, something that doesn't have a lift in versus something that does, now, when you think about that, if you were living there, you'd probably want to have a lift because it's more convenient. But if you're not the person that's living there- Who cares? Then you've got two flights of stairs to carry the shopping up from Coles. Well, you've got two flights of stairs to carry the shopping up from Coles, not your problem. And it's such a tight rental market, people will still rent it anyway, currently. And I know this sounds really brutal, this is a hard-nosed investment decision, not an emotional one. Oh, yeah, it's got a nice lift to be really convenient. No, no, no. Because the owner corp fees or body corporate fees are going to be substantially higher um, on something that's got lifts, especially if it's got multiple lifts. That's right. Um, another thing is if it's an older building, what's the sinker fund look like in terms of how much spare cash does the owner's corp have to hand? Because, you know, again, if you take something that's, say, beachfront, you go, wow, it's beachfront. It'd be easy to rent. Very true. But if it's 25, 30 years old, there's a chance that there may be some deterioration in the concrete construction or worse still the steel within the concrete. And if you get that concrete cancer and corrosion, that, that costs literally millions and millions of dollars to fix. And so you're going to want to have a fairly fat surplus in the owner corp fees if you buy in and they say right okay uh, we've got to shake the tin there's 30 units in this building so the bill's going to be 2 million bucks let's divide that by 30 that's what you've got to pay that's, that's not tough. particularly attractive and probably not quite what you bargained for when you went in so these are things to be really mindful of other things you know making sure your tax and depreciation report is done every single year to make sure you're claiming full benefit very important landlord insurance shop it around and you know there are there are companies that focus just on providing landlord insurance they offer good products but it's always good to shop around to see if you can save some money because ultimately savings is good at profit refinancing your loan all those things very 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 important from a numbers perspective lastly ab number five here in our rapid fire series for investment properties is really people not understanding the game now that's a fairly broad question Mm. uh, or broad mistake as such i'm more talking about structuring and tax because that that can really make or break that transaction It, it, it is paramount in terms of its importance. You know, specifically, one of the things I talked to in, in, in our book, the, the Wealth Playbook, is the chapter on structuring we've covered in this podcast too. Uh, and you know, I'm very pleased to see on a personal note that you've gone down that pathway immediately. So well done for not only learning it, but following it through because Thanks you've got for the advice. advice. Uh, and this is crucial, especially with things like property. So if, if, if you think about two of the big fees for property transactions, one is stamp duty, which is um, you know, the fee you pay when you buy the property. Now, depending on which state you're in, because we live in such a fragmented country. I thought we lived in Australia, but it's not. It's a very, very state-by-state parochial uh, place when you look at it from an investment perspective. If you're in states like South Australia, stamp duty is significantly higher than in other states. So if you're looking to buy and flip, that might be you know 4% uh, that you're having to pay in stamp duty, where it might be considerably less in a different state. Now, that needs to be factored in. Uh, and as we're talking off camera, you think about first-time buyers. You think, oh, great, I've got my... Um, deposit saved up, I've, I've scrimped and saved, and I've got my you know, 70, 80 grand to put down as my deposit to get started. Probably need more than that. Hopefully the bank and mum and dad have come to the party. And you're about to go and buy the property and, and, and unknown to so many people is, oh, gee, you know, I've got you know, 40 grand of stamp duty I've got to pay here as well. I didn't Plus the that fees, in. the transfer duty, and the lawyers. And, and everything else, the conveyancing, yeah. everything that goes alongside that. So stamp duty is, is, is really significant. And, and if you look at, say, New South Wales, uh, which is the state I currently live in, they, they've been, I'm not going to say more progressive, but they've actually started, and I don't agree with stamp duty. I mean, it's the same on cars. Why are you paying stamp duty for changing that? It's, it's, just, uh, it's just madness. But nonetheless, it's what we've got to contend with so our friends in Canberra can invest their money very wisely in the community, right? Cause some more inflation by increasing the money supply. <laughs> Don't get me started. I was going to say, um, this is rapid fire, remember? <laughs> so, you know, the, 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 the reality in New South Wales, they're looking at a tiered system whereby um, you can pay a one-off stamp duty fee or alternatively to make it, I guess, more affordable for first-time buyers, given you know, the property market's a bit more expensive in New South Wales, um, is you pay an annual fee instead. 
Now you go, okay, well that's that's quite progressive, which it is, because it, it can enable people in different sets of financial circumstances to be in the property market. The challenge is if your strategy is as an investor where it's a, a, a tick and flick, so you buy it, renovate it, or do something with it and look to move it on, paying stamp duty up front makes no sense. Paying an annual fee certainly does. Absolutely. If you're going to hold it for the next 30 years, it's going to become the family beach house, and you probably just want to pay the one-off fee. So again, understanding that there are differences there. But probably the the, the, the sting in the tail of the scorpion um, is land tax. And that's a, a, that's a real stinger uh, when you look at some of the things that have become, um, that, are, that are afoot in Australia right now. And if you take the Queensland government stance right now, so if you own property in Queensland, your land tax is payable on all property holdings that you own around Australia. So let's say you've got a couple of properties in South Australia or, or Victoria and a couple in New South Wales, the Queensland government will tot up the land tax for all of those properties in all of those states. And that's what you pay to the Queensland government. I don't know quite how, so you've already paid stamp duty, then you have to pay additional yeah. land tax on all of that's, them. That's your annual bill, your land tax, yeah, which, you know, there are exemptions to that, of course, primary place of residence um, and, and, and things of that nature. So there are exemptions. But if you've got an investment property portfolio, which is what we're talking about, it becomes quite the factor. Uh, and if you think about that, if you if you really have quite a substantial property portfolio, and there'll be people who listen to go, oh, that's a rich person's problem. Well, no, they've got wealthy by taking action, so don't throw stones. The reality is that it's almost unconscionable that one state can go, oh, well, I know I've only got a bit of property here, but we're going to smash you on everything. Uh, there are ways around that, of course, and, and this is why understanding the game you're in is so crucial. So, for example, I'm pretty sure on this, it may be current, maybe may, may have changed, who knows? And this is why you've got to get current advice. Um, if you own uh, something that's on a multi-dwelling, like an apartment or, or multi-dwelling complex in Queensland, there's no land tax, so therefore you kind of sidestep getting swiped on everything else. Okay. These are factors that you need to be aware of because once you're across the line, you've done the transaction, you can't back out of it. You, you paid your stamp, you're stuck in the thing, uh, and then you've got that additional running cost of your annual un, annual land tax. So there are a few sneaky things in the tail there that are important to know. And again, if we go back to this whole premise of being an investor, you've got to be educated. You have to understand the rules of the game that you're playing. Know the game, absolutely. Well, there's five blunders that none of our listeners want to make. So thank you very much for your time there, AB. My pleasure, any time, Mitch. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit that notification button, and we'll see you next week.